Hey, you guys, gals, and bums, and welcome back to A Few Bad Men. Today, we have episode four of Murder Incorporated. It took longer than usual to get everything together, but I got it done. And I got some special things for you in this video that only the boss can get you. All right, you know I got the skinny for you, okay? So, if you want to be a part of this thing, this few bad men family, you got to take that subscribe button on a one-way ride. Then you got to take a ball-peen hammer to that thumb and ring that bell, okay? Stay tuned to the end of the video. I got some announcements for the gang, all right? So, without further ado... A Few Bad Men presents Murder Incorporated, Episode 4, Canary. In the 1930s, gangbusters like Thomas Dewey and Elliot Ness made life miserable for gangsters around the U.S. Ness put Al Capone away on tax evasion, while in New York, Dewey got Charlie Lucky sent to Dan and Mora on a prostitution charge. And because of him, Dutch Schultz was dead, and Lepke turned himself in to face labor racketeering charges after being on the run for several years. Some other gangsters like Maya Lansky, Frank Costello, and Benny Siegel left New York before the eye of Dewey cast its gaze on them. Meanwhile in Brooklyn, the DA's office in the 30s was a joke. Now presidential candidate Thomas Dewey commented, what do you have to do to get a murder conviction in Brooklyn? The DA's office in the 30s was on the payroll of the syndicate. Bribes were sent through the Frost family who ran the biggest bail bond scheme in New York to make sure the grand juries never brought murder cases to trial. That all changed when William O'Dwyer became the new Brooklyn DA. When O'Dwyer took office, there were 200 unsolved murder cases in Brooklyn. He set out to take on the mob, and he hired former defense attorney Burton Turkis to join his team. From the beginning, the 40s showed that they were not going to be like the 30s. O'Dwyer instructed police to go and round up the known criminals. Any person who had financial means and no job was brought in for vagrancy. Cops began to clear the corners of the tough guys and the wannabe tough guys in Brooklyn. They were hit with vagrancy charges, and if they beat that, they were brought in again on something else. The DA was trying to send a message. In the first three weeks of 1940, Abe was arrested twice for vagrancy. He said, it's getting where I got to walk around with a bail bondsman in my back pocket. Happy Mayon saw it different. He said, if O'Dwyer don't back off, we're going to start leaving packages on every corner in Brooklyn. That'll keep him busy. The Greeks call it hubris. The streets call it cocky. But whatever you call it, the boys had it. They had become overconfident, complacent. I guess over 100 arrests between them and no murder convictions will do that. They had Brooklyn terrified. Anyone who testified against them had a death wish or was crazy. Harry Rudolph was said by the police and the people who knew him to be off his rocker. Harry was doing a stand on Rikers for a burglary. He was a dying man, and he wanted to get something off of his chest. A letter appeared on William O'Dwyer's desk, one of many. It read, I'm doing a bit here. I would like to talk to the district attorney. I know something about a murder in East New York. Signed, Harry Rudolph. O'Dwyer went to Rikers to meet with Rudolph. The first thing out of his mouth was, those rats killed my friend Red Alpert, and I saw him do it. I'll tell you who did it too. Those Brownsville guys, Abe Rellis, Bugsy Goldstein, and Dookie Mefatori. They took him when he came out of his house. O'Dwyer stood stunned. Rudolph's story checked out. He found that the boys had been brought in for questioning back in 33, but were released. O'Dwyer wasted no time in getting the grand jury to bring murder charges on Abe, Bugsy, and Dookie. Two detectives familiar with the Rellis mob went to Midnight Roses at 11 p.m. and waited for a few hours before telling someone to tell Rellis I want to see him in my office tomorrow. Rellis and Bugsy had been arrested so many times, they didn't worry. This was just another tickle, a charge that the law used to harass a criminal and get under his skin. The next morning, February 2nd, 1940, Abe and Bugsy turned themselves into O'Dwyer's office. They sauntered in cocky as ever without a care. Dookie was arrested at his house later that day. Abe and Bugsy stood before a judge with a high-powered lawyer and pled not guilty. No one showed up for Dookie. He was forced to use a public defender. All three were held without bail. O'Dwyer put even more pressure on by separating the three. Abe was sent to the tombs in Manhattan. Bugsy was sent across the bay to Staten Island, while Dookie was sent all the way up to the Bronx near Yankee Stadium. Now, Dookie Mefatori was your typical lackey. He was a low-level Shylock under Pep Strauss. 
Pep gave him the territory and made him borrow the money at a standard Shylock rate of six for five. Dookie wasn't the sharpest spoon in the drawer. He was a grown man who loved to read comic books, but he was an excellent car thief and getaway driver. He was Pep's go-to guy for stealing cars used in murders. Dookie lived a strange life. One moment he could be reading a comic, the next he could be doing something that could get him in a chair. Dookie was once recruited from a Brooklyn corner to be the wheelman for infamous bank robber Willie Sutton. While the gang was casing the joint, the cops came toward the car Dookie was waiting in. Dookie took off and never saw Sutton again. The cops felt that Abe and Bugsy would never crack, so they focused on Dookie. Dookie sat in the Bronx with no visitors, except for Lieutenant Jack Asnato. He came in and spoke to Dookie in Italian, trying to create a, a connection or a bond with the young criminal. After offering a cigarette, he said, you'd be a sucker sticker with them, Dookie. Why didn't the big shots get you a lawyer? They're trying to make you take the fall for the Alpert murder and you weren't even in on it. This was true, Walter Sage. The late Walter Sage was the one responsible for the death of Alpert. Smarten up, Dookie. They tossed Dookie into the hole so he could think on his feet. Dookie was afraid of what the boys would do if he talked, or even if they thought he talked. He had seen with his own eyes what they were capable of. On the night Puggy Feinstein got his, Bugsy arrived at Relis' house with Puggy in the car that Dookie was driving. When Bugsy came back to get Puggy, Dookie, unaware of the plan, came along. He was the third man in behind Bugsy and Puggy, and he was startled when Pep Strauss came out of nowhere and mugged Puggy from behind. He witnessed them strust Puggy up in a ball with a clothesline and saw Pep fracture Puggy's skull as he stomped him while he strangled to death. He was told to drive the corpse and Bugsy to the dump in the flatlands. He saw Bugsy dump a can of gasoline on Puggy and light a match. He was well aware. But at the same time, he was facing the chair. What was he to do? He decided to deal with the problem at hand. Dookie admitted that he had stolen the car used to transport the corpse of Whitey Rudnick and he drove Puggy Feinstein to his death and later to his cremation. On February 24th, Dookie told the cops all he knew was what he was told to do. He didn't know the whys of the crimes he was involved in. His partner, Pretty Levine, knew more than he did. You should talk to him. Abraham Pretty Levine was Dookie Mefatori's partner. Unlike Pretty Emberg, Pretty Levine lived up to his name. He was a good-looking guy, as they say. His wavy hair and blue eyes made the young Brooklyn girl swoon. Unlike Dookie, Pretty had a head on his shoulders. He was being groomed for a promotion in the gang until he got married. Pretty married a pretty young Brooklyn girl named Helen, and he decided to go straight. But the mob is not something you just quit. So Pretty didn't tell anyone about his plans. He simply stopped hanging around the boys. Pretty got himself a truck and settled in as a working man. Everything was going well for Pretty until his wife gave birth to their second child. The hospital bill was 100 bucks, payable before the patient would be released. Pretty didn't have it, but he knew who did. Pretty found himself back on the corner talking to Pep. Hey, Pep, I need a C-note. Can I get it for the five foot six? Sure you can, pal. Just find two people to vouch for you. Pretty secured the loan and took his wife and kid home. But now he owed Pep $210. And after a few weeks, he defaulted and was back working for Pep to pay off the debt. The police came and arrested Pretty at his house. Pretty knew the drill, and he kept his mouth shut. He knew what the boys did to Squealers. In an attempt to get Pretty to crack, the police got his wife to come in and talk to him. She couldn't get a babysitter, so she brought the couple's 18-month-old daughter with her. The cops told her that if she wanted her husband back, she needed to get him to talk. Pretty hugged his daughter and kissed his wife, but he kept quiet. He knew what they didn't. He knew that if he talked, there was no place that he was safe not behind bars or in police custody. He just covered his mouth and said, I can't talk. Helen said, you got her. Pretty holding back the tears said, I can't talk. How can I talk? In the end, Pretty blurted out, I'll talk about myself, then leave me alone. Me and Dookie stole a car that a stiff was left in. Then he refused to talk anymore. Go ahead, put me in jail, he said. The detective said, you're going to jail, all right, and so is your wife. She heard your confession and is now a material witness. Helen was placed in the women's house of detention. But anytime Pretty wanted to see it, he could. But he still didn't talk. 24 days, Pretty stuck to the coat. On the 25th, he met with his wife and then called for a detective. He said, if I talk, you'll protect us? 
Pretty told about his involvement with the Red Alpert case. How Pep had sent him and Dookie to bring Alpert to him. He told him how Alpert had shot at him and Dookie. He also told that on the night Red Alpert was killed, Abe came to him and told him and Dookie to have alibis for the night. He also told about Pep coming to see him while he was on vacation in Monticello and told him to be ready this evening, I need you. After picking Pep up, Pep told Pretty to drive up the road and pull over to the side and turn the lights off. A car passed by flashing its lights. Tail that car, Pep said. Pretty tailed the car with his lights off, just far enough behind where he could hear the blood curdling scream that came from the car head. They found Jack Drucker with the body of Walter Sage. Ganji Cohen, the man who let out the scream, was gone. Pretty didn't know the who's, the what's, or the why's, but he knew Pep, Abe, Bugsy, Happy, the Dasher, and Lewis Capone were the higher ups. But as far as Dookie and Pretty were concerned, Pep was the leader. March 19th, Abraham Frosch, son of Lena Frosch, who along with Rose Gold ran the biggest bail bond scheme in New York, got a message to Dookie saying, we have $5,000 for you if you change your story and put Abe and Bugsy back on the street. He was arrested. Also, at this time, if you guys watched the Albert Anastasia video that I did, you will remember that Albert and his waterfront guys were imposing attacks on the dock workers to raise funds for the boys. So I guess this is where the bribe money came from. After Dookie and Pretty spilled what they knew, arrest warrants went out for Pep, Ganji Cohen, and three others for the death of Walter Sage in 1937 and Irvin Ashkenaz in 1936. Now, I didn't cover Ashkenaz in the last video because I didn't have all the details, but now I do. Irvin Ashkenaz was one of the murders the boys did for Lepke. Ashkenaz was a taxi driver who drove people from New York to Catskills and back. Uh, Ashkenaz was on parole for killing a Lepke man during a strike in 1930. On September 5th, 1935, he was pulling up to a resort in the Catskills when shots rang out. Ashkenaz was ambushed. He was hit with five bullets in the neck, head, and chest as he sat in the driver's seat of his taxi. Big Angie Cohen was in Hollywood. That's where he went after running off into the woods the night of the Walter Sage murder. That night, Ganji ran far enough until he pushed some distance between him and the men who he had just helped kill his best friend. Ganji went into town and hopped on the first train west. During the long ride, Ganji had a chance to think about his life. He had a friend in the movie business. Maybe he could get him some work there. Ganji's friend helped get him some roles as an extra in the movies. Irving Big Ganji Cohen changed his name to Jack Gordon and became an actor. In 1939, Dookie Mefatori and Pretty Levine were taken in a movie called Golden Boy. During the movie's climactic fight scene, Pretty blurts out, there's Ganji. Dookie looked around the theater looking for Ganji. He said, where? Pretty said, right there on the screen. They left and went back to Roses to tell the rest of the boys. They didn't believe him, so they all went to the movies. Abe, Pep, Frank Abandando, Happy Mayon, Dookie, and Pretty. I could just imagine these stone killers sitting in a smoke-filled movie theater eating popcorn and peanuts. When the scene with Ganji came on, boys couldn't believe their eyes. So I wouldn't be the boss if I didn't get the footage of this. So what we're watching right here is the movie that these men watched together. All right, And their friend, Pep's former roommate, is up there on the big screen. As far as I know, Ganji is the only member of the troupe who's ever recorded on film. So. I got you the skinny, all right? Ganji was arrested in California and brought back to New York to face trial on the Walter Sage murder. On March 7, 1940, Pep Strauss, Harry Mayone, and Frank Abandando turned themselves in and were charged with the murder of Whitey Rudnick back in 1937. When Abe was told that Dookie was talking, he said, what do I care? He don't know nothing. He didn't seem worried but things had escalated faster than he or the other boys expected. You see, when O'Dwyer started putting pressure on all the hoods in Brooklyn, the, the boys decided to take a page out of Lepke's book and remove anyone who could hurt them. At the top of the list was Dookie and Pretty. For too long, Bugsy and Abe wondered why Pep kept the two around. Dookie was a moron and Pretty tried to leave the gang once already. They were a liability. But the boys were professionals. A job had to be planned out. They assumed that they would have time, but Dookie and Pretty were in the hands of the law now. O'Dwyer had them in custody. But O'Dwyer realized that Pretty and Dookie didn't have the knowledge of the gang's inner workings and would not be able to help him bring them down. They needed someone in the know. 
but no way Bugsy or Abe would talk. They had been through it all before. Relis was a legend to the police in Brooklyn. He had been arrested and worked over too many times in name, and he never mumbled a word. But on the morning of March 22nd, 1940, hell froze over, and a pig was seen flying over the New York skyline. Rose Relis, Abe's wife, pregnant with the couple's second child, came into Old Dwyer's office and said, my husband wants an interview with the law. Mrs. Relis was sent home under guard, and Burton Turkis rushed down to the tombs before Abe could change his mind. Turkis arrived with a letter of consent form, the letter that all inmates had to sign before talking to the DA. Abe, who had gotten men killed for less than this, casually signed and passed it back to Turkis. Turkis went to a judge to get a court order release. He returned to the tombs and collected his prize canary and brought him back to Brooklyn. Abe would not talk until he had a deal in place. Abe wanted to walk, walk free, totally free. After all the killings, beatings, robberies, he just wanted to walk off. He said that he knew that they had nothing on him. The law had no corroboration on the Red Albert case, and who would listen to Harry Rudolph? He was loony. Abe said, I can make you the biggest man in the country. You want to know the who's, the why, I can give it to you. But I need to cut a deal first. O'Dwyer agreed to give protection for Abe and his family and let a judge know what Abe did for the case when it was his turn to stand trial. This was as good as Abe was going to get. With his deal secured, he asked for a cigarette and the canary began to sing. According to D.A. O'Dwyer, Abe had a spectacular memory. He could tell them the details down to what he was wearing on the day a murder was committed. Not only did he talk about murders he committed, he gave them the people who could corroborate his story. When Abe started singing, he wouldn't shut up. And he ran off murder after murder, 10 years worth. He talked for two days, filling up notebooks and wearing out stenographers. Abe was a guy in the know. He cleared up almost 100 murders. He told who ordered the murders and who carried out the orders. He could give corroboration that Albert Anastasia planned the Morris Diamond murder back in 1939. Abe was at Albert's house for dinner. Also in attendance was Mendy Weiss and Charlie the Buck Workman. The two Lepke men were still on their campaign to eliminate anyone who could testify against Lepke. Abe overheard Anastasia ask Mendy about the address of Morris Diamond. Albert had agreed to kill him as a favor for Lepke. He was just waiting on the address. Mendy said he would get it to him as soon as possible. On the morning of May 25th, 1939, Morris Diamond was shot five times as he approached the Brooklyn corner. Abe talked about the gas station attendant that they should talk to. The attendant could tell a story about Bugsy Goldstein returning an empty gas can on the night of Puggy Feinstein's murder and torture. He talked about the Shapiro murders, all three. He talked about how Happy Mayon whacked Whitey Rudnick in the head with a meat cleaver after Pep had strangled an ice pick to suspect a snitch. He talked about Lepke and how he protected him while he was on the run and how they were responsible for the deaths of many of his witnesses. Even though he was in jail, he told of the Amberg brothers killing and of the Dutch Schultz hit back in 1935. The day after Abe's recital, arrest warrants were issued for Ali TikTok Tannenbaum, Mandy Weiss, Louis Capone, Charlie the Bug Workman, Mickey Sykoff, Seymour Magoon, Jack Drucker, Shalom Bernstein, Max the Jerk Gollop, and the biggest of all, Albert Anastasia. TikTok and Charlie the Bug were arrested together. Ali was charged in the murder of Irvin Ashkenaz, and Workman was held as a material witness. Bugsy's pal Seymour Magoon was charged, along with Bugsy Goldstein, for the killing of Irvin Penn by accident. It was a mistaken identity. They were supposed to kill a man for Lepke, but killed Irvin Penn instead. Jack Drucker was sought in the Walter Sage murder. A Miss Nesfield came forth and identified Max Golub and Frank Abandando as the killers of Spider Murtha. Louis Capone was brought in and charged for the Joseph Rosen murder, as well as Mendy Weiss, who was on the lam. Sykoff and Bernstein were wanted as material witnesses. Albert Anastasia was in the wind. And unlike Lepke, he would not turn himself in. Happy was in the tombs, and he was thinking who could hurt him. Then Julie Catalano came to see him. Julie had been Happy's friend since they were kids. Julie was the one who helped, along with Frank Abandando, to free Happy from the police custody in 1928. 
he and the Dasher served a few years for it. Julie was the driver on several murders, including the double murder of Siciliano and Lataro. A few weeks before the visit, Julie was caught up in the borough wide clamp down on the mob. He had done 60 days for vagrancy, and when he got out, Vito Garino told him Happy wanted to see him. But by the time Julie got to the tombs, Abe was singing, and Happy was not happy to see Julie. He said, what are you doing here? You'll get pinched. He told Julie to get out of town, but he didn't want to, so he told Happy he would, but then he didn't. When Happy found out, he started to think about how much Julie knew. He got word to Vito Garino to hit Julie over the head. Two days later, Julie was walking down the street outside of his house when Vito Garino pulled up and told him to get in. They were going to Long Island to hide out until the school's off. Julie wasn't stupid. He knew that he would never come home from the ride if he got in that car. For the first time in his life, Julie prayed for a cop. Lucky for him, O'Dwyer had become aware of his knowledge and sent some men to bring him in. The crackle of the radio from a police car caused Vito to pull off. Julie almost fell into the arms of the police. Another guy who Happy wanted dead was a man named Joe Liberto, known as Joe the Baker. Joe wasn't a member of the gang, but he was a partner in the garage with Vito Garino. He had seen some things and Happy thought that he should go. The Baker was in jail in Queens on a vagrancy charge. At around 1 a.m., a guard came to him and asked him if he wanted to see Vito Garino. The guard took him to the prison kitchen where Vito was sitting on the table. Vito asked him if he needed anything. He said, yeah, I need some socks and some underwear and some money for cigarettes. Vito said, okay. He said, did you tell him anything? He said, no, so happy I haven't said anything. Vito told him he had some pool with the warden and that if he ever wanted to take a ride at night to get some fresh air, he could arrange that. The baker said he would think about it. When he got back to his cell, he told the guard he never wanted to see Vito Garino again. A few days later, he reached out to O'Dwyer. When asked why he turned rat, Abe said he was sick of the way he was living. He had a son and another on the way. He didn't want to go on living like this, with the killing and all. He said that he wanted to leave the gang, but Pittsburgh Phil wouldn't let him. He was the real killer, along with Happy Mayon. He said not only did they commit the murders, but they sought out opportunities to murder. No means was too cruel for them. He said he even tried to stick up for the younger members who wanted to get away from the gang, like Pretty. Abe said Pretty had gotten a job hauling ashes, and Pep literally grabbed him from the truck and brought him back into the gang. Abe told O'Dwyer that he had repeatedly tried to leave after the birth of his son, and he was done with killing, but Pep wouldn't let him. Okay, wow. After all that, Abe tries to put it all on everybody else. Like he was just an innocent man being forced to, into a life of crime. He, he was Brooklyn public enemy number one. And, and one just said that he was worse than Dillinger, and now he was playing the victim. His wife even agreed to sing. She would corroborate Abe's story of how Pep and Bugsy killed Puggy Feinstein. This is, this is crazy. O'Dwyer received a letter from Pep Strauss saying he wanted to talk. He said that he could tell him everything they needed to know. He just had one stipulation. He needed to meet with Abe Rellis first. He needed to make sure that his story was straight. O'Dwyer was no dummy. He knew that if he let Pep in the room with Abe, he'd have one less witness. Besides, O'Dwyer could put a blindfold and reach into a pile of murder cases and pull one out that Pep did. O'Dwyer even had Pep's girl, Evelyn Middleman, and was holding her as a material witness under $50,000 bail. She was called the kiss of death girl, and she wasn't talking either. But Ali TikTok Tannenbaum decided to join Abe, Dookie, and Pretty's choir. It was the testimony of TikTok that got Lepke involved. Lepke was already in jail for union racketeering. TikTok told O'Dwyer that he overheard Lepke give the order to kill Joe Rosen. Lepke, sitting in the cell in Leavenworth, was arrested for murder and brought back to New York to face trial. Another big name that TikTok Tannenbaum talked about was Ben Siegel. He could testify that Ben was the driver on the Big Greeny Greenberg murder in Los Angeles. He also cleared up the five-year-old murder of Dutch Schultz. He said that Mendy Weiss and Charlie the Bug Workman walked into the Palace Chop House in Newark, New Jersey on October 23, 1935 and blew Dutch and three of his associates away. Charlie the Bug was hit with a murder charge in his cell. O'Dwyer's office charged Happy Mayoni, Frank Abandondo for the May 26, 1937 murder of Whitey Rudnick. They could have put Pep Strauss on trial for almost any of the murders, 
but they decided to put him on a trial for Pucky Feinstein murder, along with Bugsy Goldstein. They will put Mendy Weiss, Louis Capone, and Lepke on the Joe Rosen murder. Charlie the Bug cooperated and was spared the death penalty and was sent to New Jersey to stand trial on the Dutch Schultz murder. Now you talk about a speedy trial. Abe started talking on March 25th. Happy May on the Frank Abendando's trial will start May 15th. They will go on trial for the murder of Whitey Rudnick. Now that's why I gotta leave you guys off with for this episode. Episode five will be coming up soon. I've already started to write it. So I'm gonna have that out in a couple days. All right, I just needed to drop this off right now for you. Okay, so I said I had an announcement. I'm going to, first, first of all, I'm gonna be bringing back the merch store. Just give me a few weeks, I'll bring that back. And I got some new merchandise for everybody. And you can go there and you can buy your, your few bad men gear. All right. Second, I'm going to do a live stream, my first live stream after I finish this Murder Incorporated series. All right. So we can sit and we can talk about the Murder Incorporated. You guys can ask questions. Uh, we, we, you know, whatever we want to do on a live stream, it'll be my first one. So, so we're just going to like roll with the punches and see how it goes. All right. So make sure that you take that subscribe button on a ride. Take that ball peen hammer to that thumb. Ring that bell. Share the video. If you want to slide an envelope upstairs, the super thanks and PayPal link is down below. And I appreciate everyone who has donated so far. You guys make making these videos a lot easier when you do that. All right. So this has been a few bad men. Keep your nose clean and don't take any wooden nickels. I see you in the funnies. <laughs>